to the book of Nehemiah. Hadn't the Lord been good to us? Uh, bless the Lord. Mm, thank the Lord. He's good to us. He's good to us. It's been a wonderful, it's been a wonderful week of sacred assemblies. The Spirit of the Lord and the Word of God has uh, been powerful. Yes, sir. In our midst. Amen. And I'm thankful for it. And it's wonderful to see the good people of God. Uh, I'm going to enjoy spending a thousand years with y'all. Amen. I really am. We'll be over there shortly. And uh, we'll be on the other side shortly. With our loved ones who have gone on in the Lord. Right. And... Uh, just a little while to linger, just a little while to serve. I've enjoyed the good singing tonight. And uh, boy, Wyatt did a good job. Where'd he go? Uh, that was a good job, boy. I never heard you sing quite like that. That was good. And uh, that man killed a deer. Did y'all know that? <laughs> Eight point buck killed a goose, too. Blew its head off. I know about that. <laughs> And uh, you learn a lot of things at IHOP. <laughs> you learn a lot of things down there. And uh, oh, it's a joy. It's been a joy to be with you. We sure love you. The Lord's knit our hearts together. I, I want you to find Nehemiah in the second chapter. But I did want to mention very quickly before I read the text. I want to thank God for the comforter. Amen. 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 It's just been on me a little bit today, and the Lord bumped it around in my heart a little bit. Uh, aren't you glad for the that our God, uh, how He tenderly and gently loves us, yes, sir. reassures us. And uh, somebody said, if a man wants to know how to love his wife, as Christ loved the church, uh, spend every day giving her the reassurance that she needs that you love her. For some reason, I guess you women have short memories or low confidence levels. You have to be reminded every day. I had an old deacon. It's a true story. Whoo, it's a rough one, boy. It's, he said... Uh, I told Betty 40 years ago I loved her when I married her. I ain't changed my mind. I was, he, he, he never told her again <laughs> that, that one time. But, uh, oh, and that's what the Lord does for us. Every day, the old songwriter said, every day he comes to me with new assurance. And that's how a husband can love his wife, reassure her every day. And uh, that, that love and that security. And that's what the Holy Ghost does. He's a comforter. He comforts us in our sorrows. He comforts us in our struggles. Comforts us in our sin nature. Oh, a saved man will hate. He'll say, oh, wretched man that I am doing what I'm against and can't do what I'm for. Romans 7, y'all talk to me. Right. Thank God the Holy Ghost comforts us in our supplications, praying for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. He comforts us in our, in our salvation. He's the only one that can bear witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. Right. Amen. Amen. Oh, I tickle at some of the old formal independent fundamental bat thinking they can give somebody assurance of their salvation. <laughs> wow. I thought there was only three in the Godhead. <laughs> I guess you too, huh? Thinking you can give someone the assurance of their salvation. Well, you can point them through the Bible. 
but uh, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit right. that we are the children of yes. God. Thank God for the Comforter. Thank the Lord. And in these, in these troubled times, Paul said we're in perilous times. And uh, I never did like preaching the headlines at my church. Good night. Some preachers don't ever read their Bible. They just watch the news and regurgitate it every Sunday. Uh, I didn't preach the headlines at my church. I didn't even preach the special days. On Veterans Day, I would honor all the babies or something. <laughs> Mother's Day, I'd preach on your mama ain't the one who died for you. Fourth of July, I'd preach on uh, tithing. <laughs> Christmas, I'd preach on uh, the lake of fire. Easter, I had a special sermon on. How come I ain't seen you since Christmas? <laughs> that was the title of my sermon. <laughs> That's a true story. I, to me, God and His world go way beyond. I ain't going to pull Him down into our holidays. Help me now. I grew up for every Mother's Day. The oldest mama, the youngest mama, the most kids mama. I, I spiced ours up. I'd say, the meanest mama. Let's let the kids take the vote right there. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the mama that needs most praying for. I just spiced it up, you know, changed it up on her. <laughs> Amen. That one lady that had 14 kids, you know she's going to get the most kids every, every year, you know. And then you couldn't ask these days for the newest mama. <sighs> I learned that one two or three years in a row. <laughs> You're supposed to have a husband in there. <laughs> Our generation. <laughs> oh, dear time. Well, I never did want to belittle or demean God and try to make holidays. Now, all my friends do, and I'm even there for their services, and I go along with it. <laughs> I don't have a choice. And there ain't nothing wrong with that. It just, I, I, I just, to me, the Lord, what He did at the cross, what He's going to do at the second coming, what he's doing for us right now in glory. I ain't got time for holidays. I'm excited about one real holy day. Amen. Amen. Somebody said if you get full of the Holy Ghost, that Calvary will seem like it was yesterday and the second coming's in the morning. Right. Yeah. Nothing else will burn in your heart. Well, I've been loved being with you. Nehemiah, the Lord's given me a burden for the church tonight and uh, preach a message for the church. And I wanted to mention that for the believer, the good comforter, the Holy Ghost. I'll take a little, there's a water. There's a water. You shouldn't need a trail mix health bar right before church. <laughs> Thought it would make me healthy. Instead, the peanuts got stuck in my teeth. I'm getting old. My teeth are falling out. I got a back one that, that just crunched up on its own and went away. <laughs> yeah, wait till you're 54. And, uh, but I kind of like it now. It's a little, I store things in there. And <laughs> I stick my tongue in there and meditate. And, it's my little safe spot. I just go to, to it, but it don't mix good with trail mix bars. Jennifer said, do you need to get that fixed? I said, I like it better than what it was. Now, if several of them come out, I'll be seeing, I'll be, I'll be down there at the coroner's office borrowing people's dentures. <laughs> I'm an independent veteran. We don't have a health plan or a savings account. I'll be down there calling my buddy. Hey, had anybody lately with, you know, some extra ones? <laughs> Nehemiah 2. I want to show this to you. Nehemiah 3. Lord, we do thank you for Calvary. Thank you for what you've done for us. One more time now. Bless us and strengthen us, Lord, and we'll love you in Jesus' name. 
And all the Lord's people said, Amen. I want you to circle three things quickly. Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse 1, circle that sheep gate. Do you see it? Eliashab, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. Then come down to verse 3. But the fish gate, circle that fish gate. After you circle that sheep gate. But the fish gate did the sons of Hassanah build. And then come on down to verse 6. Moreover, the old gate repaired Jehoiada, the son of Paseah. And uh, let's just read them other names for fun. And Meshulam, the son of Besedelah. <laughs> I have no idea if that's how you say them, but you don't know either. So we're all even right there. Alexander Scorby knows, and he's probably making it up. Circle that sheep gate, fish gate, and old gate. And that's not where I'm going to dwell tonight, but the Lord, if He's going to send a mighty move of God and a revival of sorts, that would be what we would pray for. Let's pray for, hey, y'all, activity at the sheep gate. And that's salvation. That's the Lamb. Right. That's where the sheep would come in. And for the sacrifices, the blood on the temple mount. And thank the Lord that come up out of Bethlehem to Jerusalem and go in the sheep gate. And, and let's pray. And he said that we could go in and out and find pasture. There's no bars and doors and locks mentioned on this one or bars and locks. The other ones uh, have locks and bars. Look at the end of verse 3. You see a lot of locks and bars on down in this chapter. There's no locks and bars on that one. Thank God whosoever will can come Amen. and be saved. My, my, I heard a great illustration years ago, and I was thinking a while ago about how beautiful is the church, the elect. I read something this week, Brother Lawson, I don't know, and we've got some Bible students in here, people who's been around the Word of God a long time. Uh, he said, and, and Brother Lawson, you check this out, and run it by Brother Austin and Brother Wampler, and Y'all check this out. I re the Jews were the elect nation, but the church is the elect body. Oh, I'd never, I, I'd never heard it put that way. I was reading behind the man this week. I kind of like that. Now, we don't believe in Calvinism. All five petals of the tulip are poison. Even a couple of them, even a couple of them sound like it's what we believe, but it ain't what we believe. All five, the, the five doctrines of, of, of fake grace is uh, a house of cards, and you pull one and it all comes tumbling down. Thank God that sheep gates for whosoever will. Somebody said, and I remember uh, the old grocery store I grew up with, the IGA. Dad pastored in Missouri. In the, and I grew up in Missouri in the 70s, which was a Norman Rockwell 50s. America. and uh, But you could walk up, and I believe it was our Kmart, Blue Light Special, and and the doors just uh, would stand, they'd open by theirself. And down there at my Holiday Inn Express, mm, boy, I was going to check out the Mediterranean Grill today. And I walked over there at three, and they closed at two and opened at five. I'm bitter. I ain't eating there, and I ain't going to do it. I don't, I don't care when they open. I ain't going back. But uh, <laughs> I can't be mad at people. The Lord won't let me, so I'm mad at restaurants. <laughs> you got to be mad at somebody. And uh, But my little holiday in there this week, you'd walk up to it, and it'd open. And that's exactly how salvation is. Whosoever will, that thing will open for everybody. Right, 
Hey, Amen. Now, last week I was at a church. Well, no, I shouldn't have told you. <laughs> Don't you look it up now, because now we're talking about them. And I was at a place that was in the last two or three weeks. You'll never know which one. And uh, and so they put me at a budget motel. Help me now. Independent back. Whoo, that's one time I wished I was Protestant. Maybe just be a Methodist or a Presbyterian. Amen. They stay at the Suite. Southern Baptist is at the Hampton. And Independent Baptist is at Motel 6. <laughs> we left the light on for you, but somebody shot it out last weekend. And uh, and I kept going up to the door, and it, it was the, the old-fashioned, do it yourself. <laughs> and I'd walk up there, and I'd just, oh, I got to do this. The thing wouldn't open for me. This is a works-based motel. And, uh, oh, Lord, maybe that was the Protestant motel <laughs> works based. But oh, thank God, whosoever will, let him come. Amen. Let me tell you about these fellows trying to have church for Americans. That's the contemporary church. That's the theater stage. That's the let's, let's drop all of our standards so sinners will be comfortable. I don't really want sinners comfortable in the house of God. Amen. If it's a real house of the living God, they'll come under conviction. Right. Amen. I ain't trying to get Americans to come to church. I'm trying to get Jesus to come to church. Amen. Amen. I'm having church for Jesus. Right. Amen. Now, I'm going to compel sinners, Amen. compel them to come in. I ain't going to appease Americans, but I'll compel sinners. Right. Amen. And did you know Americans ain't going to go to church unless you promise it ain't church? Right. Make it not church. And then they'll come, but just for a little bit. And we've got to get right back to Egypt and the slime pits of Sodom. Right. But let me tell you who will come to church. Americans ain't going to, but sinners will when they get sick of what America's been giving them. And I love that over there. I think it's 1 Corinthians 14, when an unbeliever comes in your midst and he is convinced of all and he is judged of all. Right. You're making a mistake, not y'all, but all across the country. It is a mistake to try to make church so sinners will be comfortable. Right. I like that 1 Corinthians 14 business. It's toward the end of it. He's convinced of all, under conviction. He is judged of all. <laughs> Come to our church. We won't judge you. Well, I hope when you come to our church, you come under judgment. Because I'd rather you come under judgment right now while there's still an opportunity for grace and mercy. And the Bible said over in 1 Corinthians 14 that he fallen on his face will confess before all and believe. And something give a report that God is in you and God is with you. Oh, friend, this, this is a whosoever will. And then that fish gate, mm, them sinners coming in and out. I'm a praying that God gives y'all a revival around here of sheep. Amen. I don't want to be ugly, and this is not, I don't, I don't know your situations. I'm preaching about 120.5 churches a year. I did the math one time. I compiled five years, run the actual averages. I'm in 120.5 churches. Somewhere there's half a church. <laughs> and I think I know which one it is, but uh, we won't talk about that. The doors don't open. But, uh, oh, dear neighbor, listen. So don't think that he's told me something that I'm shooting at something because Sometimes preachers tell me things, but I don't remember. <laughs> I've heard so much everywhere I've been. I get my stories mixed up. Amen. I'll be dealing with situation F here, and it was in church C. <laughs> and I'll think about uh, uh, problem A and jump right on it, but it was in church D. <laughs> So don't think I'm a shooting at anybody. All the churches are going through the same thing. All right. All right. 
That sheep gate, we need to revive the sheep gate when you got a goat problem. Mm -hmm. Right. Them goats. And sometimes you got to have a sheep revival mm -hmm. and get the goats weeded out. Now, if you're kin to a goat, don't you get mad. <laughs> Help me now. I, the South has got more problems because people cater to their relatives instead of following the Holy Ghost. Right. Amen. Jesus set a precedent for that. Amen. Did you know that in, uh, is it the end of Matthew 12? Did you know his brethren did not believe on him till after the resurrection? Right. I don't think his mama was right. I, I, that's what I preach at Christmas on, on the backslid Mary. <laughs> yeah. Y'all not remember that one time he come through there and, his, and, he, and he could not do mighty, many, 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 many mighty, a little uh, porky the pig right there. Uh, he could not do many mighty works there. Because of their unbelief. Right. You remember what they said? They said, is not this the carpenter's son? You know the next phrase? Can anybody quote their Bible? Is not his mother and his brethren and his sisters here with us? Right. Mary, the brothers and the sisters are standing there with the hometown against Jesus. Your Bible should have had a verse where Mary spoke up and said, excuse me, he's not really the carpenter's son. Y'all right. ain't helping me. Right. Why did his brothers not believe on him until after the resurrection? What was his mom and family doing standing there with the wrong crowd? Right. Right. Oh, this makes great Christmas preaching. <laughs> My Christmas play has a backslid Mary in it. <laughs> we throw the crib about a long time ago. It smells too much like Catholics. I just bring a backslid Mary in there and wail on her. <laughs> we have to get a little blue Christmas in there just to make people sentimental. I messed their Christmas all up. <laughs> in honor of your pastor. <laughs> And then at the end of Matthew 12, do y'all remember he was in the house, they were having a real good service, and somebody came up and said, hey, your mama and them's in the yard. Y'all read the end of Matthew? Somebody come in and, and wiggled their way in and said, uh, behold, thy mother and thy brethren are without seeking thee. Right. <laughs> do you remember what he said? Who is my mother? Boy, that's going to mess up Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. <laughs> Family reunion, huh? Family disunion. I, I've often thought, I've been in the Vatican a handful of times because of our missions over in Eastern Europe, and we have to land somewhere in Western Europe. You can't fly right into Eastern Europe. The thugs will shoot you out of the sky. <laughs> But uh, Ukraine, Russia, leave me alone. Mm, that's 20 minutes, but that's Waffle House material. <laughs> he said he's got 20 minutes. And so oftentimes we land in Rome, Italy, and, and we go down and see the thing. Well, I've been in the Vatican several times, which is, you know, the Pope's church. And I've often thought about, you know how we hang banners over our choir sometimes? You know, the theme of the year. And I see you got verses of the, you got a couple of banners here. I've been in reading them, enjoying them. I thought about taking that down there to the Pope and seeing if he wanted to hang it over his choir. <laughs> <laughs> Who is my mother? <laughs> Y'all ain't helping me. <laughs> You're Baptist in the South. You're not getting it. <laughs> <laughs> the theme of the year at the Roman Catholic Church. Who is my mother? Who are my brethren? <laughs> I'm a little honored like that. Wow, that's what he said. And he would not leave the... He said, I'll tell you who my mother and my brothers are. They're the ones in here that are hearing and receiving the Word of God. He never did go outside. 
Do y'all know you do not have to appease your family? You better please your God. Sure. Y'all help me now. <laughs> Trust me when I tell you that this, this stuff's everywhere. I ain't just picking on y'all. Sheep and goats. I'll tell y'all something. And uh, they live streaming back there, so it's y'all's own fault you don't get the full version. <laughs> Y'all have invited the whole world to look, and you know they ain't even looking. And uh, so you, you, you get the watered-down version. That's on y'all. I was in Africa, and the man told me, he said, our, our sheep and our goats look a lot alike. They're very similar. And uh, some of them are sheep, some of them are goats. It's an Africa thing. And this is what he said. He said, the way that we tell is, is their tail. And said, the sheep, and then they go down the back, and then the tail goes down. He said, said, but the goat, tail sticks straight up. And <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's how you can tell the difference. The goat shows his tail. <laughs> yeah. You see how much fun we could have with this if y'all wasn't live streaming this to everybody in America who ain't even looking? <laughs> Goats show their tail. And so I was, uh, I was in a church in Chattanooga years ago. It's the awfulest thing I'd ever seen. Church of 700, they hadn't had any problems for 28 years, but when they had them, woo, they went ahead and had them. The thing blew up and split. I was there the first Sunday. Anyway, they, I can't tell you the stories. We're not at Waffle House. And the pastor just left, old man of God, and boy, I can't even tell you. I wouldn't even, it, what a mess. I was there the first Sunday they were without a pastor. And the thing blew up. It's horrible. It's horrible. And they had a balcony. And the screaming started, raging started, tempers. And I looked around. And here's what I saw. I saw wheat and tares. You know, you can tell the difference in wheat and tares. They tell me in the Holy Land, in that, in that agricultural setting, that they look... They all look just alike while they're growing. But at the end of the harvest, the wheat, <coughs> the grain, the head of the wheat is full and fat and heavy. And the wheat bows when it's fully mature and ripe. And if a breeze blows, it really bows. But the tear looked just like wheat, but empty and straight up and stiff. And the wind don't move them. Mm -hmm. Right. And I looked around, and I hate to even talk about it, and I'm not telling you this story because there's kids in here. If they hadn't been in a church fight, they don't need to even hear about one. But it was horrible. And I looked from my vantage point, and half of that church was bowed and weeping, brokenhearted and praying. They were bowed over and weeping and praying, and half of them. <laughs> I said, Whoo. I didn't never know who saved or lost, you know. I'm not going to pretend to know who saved or lost, right. but I believe. I could have took an inventory that day and been on. I'm looking at wheat. Sure. And I'm looking at tares. Sheep, goat. You know, when the priest would retire at age 50, one of the things they did at age 50 when they retired, they'd hang around and help. And there's several things. That, one of the things they did, they guarded the gate. Because in those days, strangers... And pardon me, I'm going to talk Bible language for strangers and bastards and, and Egyptians. And they wasn't they wouldn't allowed to come in and blaspheme. It's just supposed to be the Lord's people. Right. 
And sometime to have a sheep revival of the sheep gate, we, uh, goats have to be dealt with. Uh, I was in Albania, and I got, I got a lot of sheep. We was out on a boat, and the man told me, he said, uh, we'll take you out on the boat. Now, Albania, third world, well, second world conditions, Eastern Europe, right out of communism, poverty, backwards conditions, four hours of electricity a day. That's not that way now, but it was 20 years ago. And he said, uh, we said, how many can you get on the boat? He said, 12, 12 men. And so we all come down there and got, and he looked at us Americans. <laughs> Albanians are short and like most of the world. <laughs> and uh, he said, mm, 12 Albanians, maybe six Americans. <laughs> And we broke his boat in half anyway. We got in it. <laughs> and it broke in half. It got <laughs> lit and we had to get back. Anyway, that's another story. We were so proud. We broke the man's boat. We were all redneck. We're like, yeah, this is awesome. There you go, American. USA, USA. Amen. <laughs> but uh, before we broke his boat in half, we were going down the shoreline there, the Ionian Sea. In the Aegean Sea, where they came together, and looking up on the beautiful mountainside next to us, we're in the water. And there was a flock of sheep, and there was a flock of goats. And this man was not a Christian. He had no, but we were all preachers. He had no idea. He was, he was loading our ammunition. He said, I will tell you all the difference between sheep and goats. And every one of us like, mm-hmm, come on, amen. <laughs> come on, a bunch of Baptist preachers, you know. We can get an illustration off a piece of chewing gum and a doorknob. But, but when, 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 you, when you say, I will tell, here are the sheep, here is goats, all of us like, no, oh, I got a month-long series now. You know, bring it, bring it. So we were all like a bird dog on point. Whoa. And he just talked a while. We were having our own revival. Amen. He had no idea. He, and here was his words. He said, I, <laughs> I feel sorry for the goat herder. He said, much better to be a shepherd. He said, the goat the man that watched the goats, he stayed tired all the time. He said, because goats will not sleep at night. They run around all night. <laughs> I'm like, yep, that's the first two nights of the revival. <laughs> and then he said, he said, uh, but the sheep, wherever the shepherd is, when the sun's at, they just lay down with the shepherd. <laughs> they lay down and sleep all night. Amen. He said, that goat, that goat herder, he is so tired. He said, his goats are always sick. They eat anything, everything, eat poison, eat trash. He said, they're always sick. He's always having to help them. They're always sick. He said, the sheep, they eat the grass. <coughs> Shepherd takes them to the grass. He said, goats run out in front and get lost and wander off. He said, I feel sorry for the goat man. He stay tired. He said, but the shepherd, the sheep, stay behind him or stay around him. He said, and only one goes off and don't go far. He goes and gets it. Oh, we were sitting there just eating it up. Now, and I'm going to say this to y'all. Make sure you're not a goat. And make sure you don't act like a goat. Amen. And when goats act out in churches in the South, uh, don't let your goat nature rise up. Make sure you yield to the Holy Ghost and act like a sheep. Got to have a sheep revival. And then fish. That's the sinners. <coughs> Follow me, Matthew 4, 19, and I will make you fishers of men. What a lovely thing it'd be if there'd be a revival of sinners coming in them doors. Mm. 
Oh, my. Oh, my. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. As the Father hath sent me, even so send I you. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Brethren, it is the great commission of the church. I, I'm from the old-fashioned camp meeting crowd, and I'm from the old-fashioned great commission crowd. One of them crowds that believes in having a good service. I believe in having church. I believe in having a good service. That is what church is about, coming together and having church. Why would you have church if you're not going to have church? Why would you have a church in your life if you're, the church ain't going to have church? A good service. And we assemble, and that's half of our life. But then it's not just about the flock, it's about the field. He says, come in, and he also says, go out. Right. One crowd's total focus is on giving God good service. Soul winners, door knockers, bus route, Bible college, let's go get them. They give God good service. And then another crowd believes in praying and preaching and singing and shouting and having church and being in the glory and the presence of the Lord. They believe in God giving us a good service. Well, I'd like to report to y'all, both camps are right. When I, well, I thought y'all was going to Nehemiah too, but y'all ain't going to make it there. When I was a teenage preacher boy, my daddy pastored in the woods in Tennessee. I'd, I'd stick my thumb out in the local church community and catch a ride down to Rasaka to the camp meeting. And them old time men believed in earnest pray, prayer and believed in glory preaching and believed in worshiping the Lord. Right. There was an old-fashioned outfit down there that was in a pine thicket seeking the Lord. They wanted to win Christ. Paul, been saved 30 years, wrote the book of Philippians, said that I may win Christ. Yes, I'd, I'd catch a ride down to Resaca. That's where I heard Edgar Thomas, and that's where I heard John Phillips, and that's where I heard Milton Taylor, and that's where I heard them great men of God. And then I'd stick my proverbial thumb out in the local church community and catch a ride up to Chattanooga, Lee Robertson, Tennessee Temple, Highland Park, Southwide Baptist Fellowship, Sword of the Lord, conference. And them men was up there in the city. As opposed to the boys that was down in the woods seeking the Lord, these men were all up in the city seeking the lost. That bunch in the woods was trying to win the Lord. That bunch up in town was trying to win the world. That bunch in the woods was worshiping God over the work that Christ had done for them. And that bunch up there in the town was a worshiping God by doing a work for him. And you know what? <laughs> you might be a redneck if, if you have your own language. <laughs> you know what? They were both right. Right. And I often thought the only thing that that Chattanooga crowd needs is what that Resaca crowd has. Right. And the only thing that Resaca crowd needs is what they're doing up there in Chattanooga. <laughs> and I'd like to go down in the pine thickets and tell them boys been seeking the Lord 50 years. Hey, whoo, come out of there for a minute. I know he's wonderful. And he's so wonderful, you might want to tell your neighbors before we all go into eternity. 
come out of the woods and get in the highways and hedges and tell. You've been seeking the Lord? Come up here and seek the lost. And you know what, y'all? <laughs> Do you know what, y'all? I'd love to win to Chattanooga and tell them, hey, 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 guys, come here. Come off the sidewalk just for a minute. Park that bus just for a minute. Come here. Get out of all your 911 th Bible college things you got to do before Saturday. Come here. Uh, come out here in the pine thicket. Holler his name twice. It'd be real good for you to actually get to know the one you're telling everybody about. The reason they're not listening to you is because it don't mean nothing to you. You're just trying to work your way out of guilt and shame. Right. If you actually get to know how wonderful he is, you could really tell people how wonderful he is. You need to come off the sidewalk for a minute and get in that pine thicket and seek the power of God and seek the presence of God and the touch of God and the anointing of God. This revival of the sheep gate and the fish gate. There ought to be a burning ache in the heart of this man and of this place that God would fill this place with sinners to get saved. And wouldn't settle for nothing else. And then the old gate. Hmm. Mm. When you get them sinners in here, take them to the old gate. In my studies on the gates around Jerusalem, now aren't you glad God's city has a wall? Aren't y'all, aren't y'all, isn't it just absolutely knee-slapping, ridiculous, backwards, ironic? The idiocy, <laughs> I think I just made up a word. <laughs> of our nation. We're going to send our money and our soldiers to other countries to make sure they have a border. Right. Have walls. I'm telling you, the Marxists and the communists hate America. And they're trying to destroy it. They, and and they, they wouldn't let old T-Rump build a wall. And then I go to the other side of the world and fight for everybody else's border and make sure and eradicate ours. I was going to call Rush Limbaugh one time. <laughs> I listen to him every day religiously. I knew have to turn it off because none of it was full of the Holy Ghost, but it was a lot of fun to get mad. How <laughs> I mean, you need to be mad about something or you've not had a good day? And, uh, oh, they were talking about walls and borders, and I was going to call him and tell him, hey, a bunch of liberals were calling in, you know, no walls, no borders. And then the contemporary churches. Last week I was in town, we rode by, and the pastor showed me it was the name of the church. That was the name of the church on the sign. The church without walls. I'm like, what are y'all doing? It rains. <laughs> That was the name of the blessed place. The church without walls. Do you not love your kids? <laughs> I was going to call Rush and tell that outfit. God's city has walls. Right. Jerusalem. Sure. And in the new Jerusalem has walls. Right. Yeah, pretty big ones. Mmm. Thank God his walls also has gates. Amen. Walls keep the enemy out. Gates let the needy in. This church ought to have walls and it ought to have gates. The old gate. So in my study of Nehemiah's gates, found out why they called it the old gate. Here's your several O's. It's called the old gate because there was a time it was the only gate. And it was the original gate. And there's some history right there. Many a Bible preacher and teacher have speculated pretty strongly 
that the Melchizedek and Abraham meeting was at the old gate. And if it wasn't at the old gate, then they believe Melchizedek came from the old gate to meet Abraham. Oh, dear neighbor. Whoo! Hey, y'all want to know what, y'all? I want to raise my kids where the old men had some old meetings. And there was old money there. That's where Abraham gave tithes. There was investments. There was registries. There was records. Y'all ain't helping me. There was an old mill. He brought forth bread and wine. Woo! What? One of them early Lord's suppers. Mm, old memorials. Old meetings. You know what these three young men need? And I had them backwards. I had the baby the oldest and the oldest the baby. But I had the middle one the middle. You're never going to escape it, son. The man in the middle. And that's who they crucify. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> You'll never be the eldest with all the privileges of the eldest. And you won't be the baby with all the petting of the baby. You're the middle man. They'll crucify you. Enjoy it. <laughs> Yours will be a good life. <laughs> you know what these three boys need? Same thing your two boys and little girl needs and all them girls y'all get. Same thing these little fellers need right here. This little baby. Y'all need to have some old meetings here. The old men. The old memorials. That old bread and wine needs to be brought out. Them old treasures need to be brought out. The old heritage. <laughs> I'm sorry, we don't need to turn this thing into a bunch of homosexual acting, nightclub singing, Pigeon Forge Theater, lights and spotlights and smoke, way too many instruments and special effects. Help me now. Right. right. Spotlights, colored lights, dear time. We ain't a theater. Right. That ain't a stage. Right. right. Amen. It's an altar. Right. It ain't even a platform. That's a pulpit. Right. I call all this the altar. Amen. That's what I call all of it, Brother Lawson. Amen. Sister Toy, you're raising them young'uns on the altars. Little White told me tonight, met me in the parking lot, the great killer of gooses and deers. He blowed a goose's head off. <laughs> God bless, boy. You kill all the gooses you can. There'll be more of them in a V formation here in a little bit. He told me tonight, he said, I'm singing with Mama tonight. He said, but you won't hear her, you'll hear me. <laughs> He said, I sing loud. <laughs> I said, you mighty goose slayer. Get in there and sing, boy. <laughs> sing your song and kill your goose. You're raising them on the altar. All this is the altar. This is the pulpit. The Lord's table. And I know we don't have technically, officially, we don't have church furniture in the church age. These are not by law. They're not required. But the Levites, and the, you know, they had the furniture in the... These are not required. But they're symbolic, and they're okay. It's good to have an altar. It's good to have a Lord's table. Good to have a pulpit. Good to have the cross behind the pulpit. Amen. Almost without exception. And I don't even know if y'all meant for this to be the Lord's table. But almost without exception, when you see the Lord's tables up here in the church age, I've only seen one that wasn't. They're all open. <laughs> That's because the veil was rent in twain. That Old Testament Ark of the Covenant, it was closed. Enclosed. Oh, but Jesus. And it contained all of our failures. It contained the broken tablets of the law. 
contained a lot of things that reminded us of, his, of our, the failures of man. Sure. The old gate. I called the, the, your pastor up here last night in the middle of that holy service. Thank God we had a holy service last Amen. night. Amen. I called him up here at one point. He stood down there and I stood here. Something I came across during COVID. I preached to a lot of empty sanctuaries. The pastor would meet me down there. They'd put up a phone. And uh, I recommend, and I ain't going to get y'all in trouble. Y'all do whatever you want to. You know I ain't going to be upset. But uh, I think we probably need to turn all our cameras off so people will go to church. There are a lot of people sitting at the house so they can watch it from the living room. Sure. You say, well, what about the people in the hospital and the people in the rest home? Do what we did in the old times. Carry them a tape. Right. I'm afraid these things let more devils in than more God gets out. Sure. And, and my object, and I'm not scolding, no, I don't know why y'all do that, but maybe the Lord told you. Don't take that down unless the Lord tells you. This, I'm just talking out loud. My generation knows that they're being recorded and people will not relax and do things because they're under observation by people who will record this and mock it later. I'm recommending they turn off all the cameras so y'all can come in here and have a safe place to worship. He said, well, does somebody need that? They can find them a church. God will find them. I'm just talking to y'all. Is that all right? Amen. I'm just talking to you. We set them up during COVID and we never took them down. During COVID, I met with so many pastors and they'd have a, a phone. And the first one I met with, he had, he had a thing set up for YouTube and next to it, a thing set up for Facebook. And everybody was scrambling around trying to figure out and me and him met then at the Lord. It was just me, the pastor, his wife. He had two boys. He had a sound person, and, and, and that was it. That was the most confounded of times. And me and him met down here by accident. Lord told me that during all of COVID, I met in so many empty sanctuaries and would preach to a phone. And the Lord told me, and every one of them, I, I stayed at the Lord's table. Wouldn't go in the pulpit. I'd preach from right here. And often I'd have the pastor on the other end. The two witnesses of the church age, the pastor and the evangelist. Oh, y'all ain't helping me. Don't get your feelings hurt because I talked about your phone. Y'all are more grown up than that. Talk to me. I'm, I'm an evangelist. Live in the churches. You better listen. You better listen. A lot of times in our churches we let people make decisions that they shouldn't have no business making decisions. I need a little help. Right. Right. Because one person likes something. This contemporary music, which turns our churches into rock concerts, and then they drop all the Bible standards, all the dress standards, right. all the Bible version standards, and all the preacher standards. Yeah. It ain't never come from the young people. Right. I have yet to meet one young person Amen. who says, if you know, if you'll have a soft rock concert, we'll love church. It's always some 37-year-old deacon's daughter that's full of herself. Right. It's always some 21-year-old youth pastor. If I was going to have a youth pastor, I'd get an 87-year-old grandpa. <laughs> That's the truth. I've actually had three or four men took me up on that. Why would you get a young man and mix him up with all the young girls of this generation when everybody's got a phone? They're all texting each other at midnight. That 85-year-old youth pastor will not even have a phone. He's got a flip phone. <laughs> he's got, and he's mad that he's got that. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's right. I hang out with a lot of old people. <laughs> I go into, like, 
early morning restaurants and where old, nothing but old men are gathered. And, uh, you know, this young generation, and all of us old men have the same ringtone. <laughs> and none of us can hear. And so every time one of them, <laughs> we don't know that you download and upload and there's funny things and fancy things, you know. Is everyone I'm sitting there with 19 old men in the average place wherever the old men meet for biscuits. One phone rings and all 19 of us look for our phone. Hey, that, yeah, that, 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 that's my phone. That, that, my, oh, that, that, that phone. <laughs> oh, y'all wait till you get on up in here. It's a lot of fun. I ain't old enough to be acting that old, but I'm already acting that old. This is not good. <laughs> Huh. No, it'll be some slimy youth pastor. It'll be some spoiled deacon's daughter, nearly 40, trying to be a teenager still. Y'all talk to me. Right. Don't you let one goofy woman or one backslid goat hold power and cause decisions in the church. The men ought to stand with the man of God and you make wise decisions. Somebody said, well, they're going to get upset. Well, boil your noodles in water and they'll be soft. That's a good suggestion. Don't be so brittle. Right. Hey, don't you wish Oprah Winfrey had that kind of wisdom? <laughs> Boil your noodles in water and they won't be so brittle. That's chicken noodle for the soap right there. <laughs> I just I seen it in a truck stop. I don't know. Just saw it in a book rack. Have no idea. Huh? That's a little straight talk to y'all. The average church, hear me now. The average church, if they'll have 200 people, the whole outfit will suffer because two people have to have their way. Right. Yep. And 198 people are too courteous. Right. Yep. That's exactly right, preacher. I wish y'all knew how many churches that, you know, are needing a pastor. And oftentimes they'll turn to me, help, you know, oh my soul, y'all. There'll be 89 people. And 86 of them wanting the will of God. And three of them that happen to be in key positions somehow. And them not heads will mess it up for the whole outfit. I'm just talking to y'all. Talking to you about the church world. You can't go with your mother and your brothers and your sisters when they're standing against Jesus. And you can't let goats run the thing, and you can't let two people that like something run ruin it for everybody because them two ain't got no sense. Right. Amen. Amen. Well, we'll hurt them. They need to be herded. Amen. Their noodles ain't been boiled. <laughs> they brittle every time you get around them, cracking and popping and smack. Y'all talk to me now. I wouldn't do it. I pastored nearly one decade, and I wouldn't let two rebels and one grouch pot ruin it for everybody. I just told the grouch pot and the rebels, hey, quit being idiots. <laughs> you ain't going to ruin this church no more. <laughs> Man came up to me after two years. He'd run off many a preacher. Ooh, I can tell you some stories that involve blood more than once. They run one man out and they run him through the gauntlet and the women hit him over the head with their heels and when he went out and the men kicked him out in the yard. That's where I pastored. Welcome to the ministry. He came up to me after two years. He sat right here. He didn't have near as cool a hair as you had, sir. He came round up and he come. We're, we're, we're voting tonight. We're having a tell you they're done. You sit down. We're voting tonight. Well, he had done run off every pastor since 1966, and uh, this wasn't planned because I didn't know it was going to happen. But I just followed him back, <laughs> and I just hollered louder. <laughs> and he sat down, and <laughs> I, did, I was doing it before I knew I did it. 
I got up in the chair and was leaned over and screaming at the man. I don't remember what I said, but I'm sure it was something I would agree to. to. <laughs> and I just preached at him. And I just stood up and said, how do y'all feel? You want, this, you want this guy to run the church another 10 years or do y'all want to? And they all stood up and standing ovation, cheered and clapped. And I said, you've been whatever you're going to do. It just got shot down. <laughs> and you know, he was so mean and they were so crazy. He never missed a service. <laughs> he just continued to cooperate. He was, <laughs> he was just, just, <laughs> didn't go his way that night, but it didn't even bother him. He just continued. I'll sit over here and be mean the next 15 years. <laughs> and then I acted like it never happened. I just carried right on, you know. <laughs> okay, we're past that. Had a woman over here, and she hollered out. Well, you can't do it. Right after he had done that, about the service after. Boy, it crushed her husband. He knew she had spoken out against the Holy Ghost in the body of Christ. She come down with a hernia in her forehead, not a hernia, a uh, aneurysm right in her forehead. Doctor said if you sneeze, it could kill you. He came down with cancer. Bad. A deacon's wife and a deacon. Folks, where God's having real church, he ain't playing games. Right. Amen. And you know, she apologized. A couple of she got that aneurysm. Doctor said, if you sneeze, you'll die. If you sneeze just right, you'll die. You'll bleed out in your head. She stood up and come down, stood here. And she apologized to the church. And she apologized to me. And she said, will you pray for me? And I said, yes, ma'am. And folks, <laughs> I didn't. This just happened. I didn't think. I wouldn't. I grabbed her. <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am. And I'm <laughs> looking right there. <laughs> no wonder I didn't kill her. <laughs> I was going to lay hands on where it was and pray for her. <laughs> and I popped that hair back into her and said, <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am. Bam, bam. <laughs> that was worse than a hard sneeze. Fortunately, she didn't fall over dead. <laughs> and I prayed for her. She got right with her church, got right with her God, got right with her preacher. Went to the doctor the next week. He said, it is not there. That woman's still alive tonight. 90-something. And you know her and her husband to this. Now they're both still alive in their 90s. I get a Christmas card every year. And I get a birthday card with cash in it every year. Because we got real close. We survived our first two years together. And then I, when she got right, I made, buried it and let's go on. Amen. And we did. And I get that every year. And he got that cancer. And they cooked him out. It was horrible. 11 months of chemo. And I was preaching up in North Carolina. The first surgery he had, the first bit, and 40 of his family was in there. And I preached, and I had a young man with me. And I said, let's go. i got to be there in the morning. We drove all night, and I walked in that hospital. And that family, which hated me, I walked in there and he said, I told y'all my preacher would be here. I told you my preacher would be here. And I hugged him and hugged his wife and I held them the whole 11 months. And do you know who was one of my biggest backers from then on? He was. He'd been mean a lot of years to a lot of people, but he became my friend. And in his old age, he got sweet. Folks, we have to fight the good fight. But when that's done, don't continue to fight stupid fights. That's right. He ended up going on to heaven some years later. But his precious wife's still alive. 
And I saw her the other day. We was all at a funeral. And I run to her and grabbed her. I said, 904-782-3675. She cried. She said, it's still the same number. <laughs> I said, I ain't forgot. You're precious. We held hands. She's in her 90s. So we held hands and talked for 20 minutes. <laughs> Folks, you can do the right thing, fight the right fight, and then you can have the right spirit. And things can turn out right. They don't have to turn out wrong. But you don't go along with wrong. Sheep gate. Fish gate. Old gate. The old paths. Amen. Well, wouldn't it be something if the Lord tarries is coming? The power of God to give y'all those three areas. You got a good man, you got God's man. You got good families, good people. Old brother Caldell left us a good heritage, good foundation. God can do it. I'm praying for it. Y'all been very patient, very kind every night. Let's bow our heads. Let's have a pianist come. Let's all stand. And one more night, could I ask you to come around the altar and let's pray. Let's pray over these things. One more night. Let's gather around and ask the Lord for his power, for his outpouring, for a move of God.